for joining Freedom Church of the Black Hills. We are so blessed that you chose to worship with us today. In a few moments, we're going to be entering into praise and worship followed by an on-time message. And there's a scripture I just want to share with you to get us charged and get us excited about singing to the Lord. It says in Psalms 100 verse 1 through 2, it says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Let's lift up our voices today. Let's lift up the King of kings and the Lord of lords because he is worthy to be praised.
three of our series that's taking us all the way to Easter. Crosswords. We've been looking at the powerful words of Jesus. Not the words that he spoke from when he was in a boat or Sermon on the Mount or even the Last Supper. We have been looking at the powerful words that he spoke when he was nailed to the cross. His words reveal the attributes of him and his character that we should strive for as believers. In other words, if we're picking up our cross daily and we're taking that step by step, then we should build or have character just like Jesus. It's a work in progress. Each and every one of us, we're never going to achieve all of it. We can't be like Jesus. He was perfect. However, we can strive to have the character and attributes of him if we are true believers in Christ. If we claim to be his disciples and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to this fallen world, then we should possess the fruits of the Spirit and the attributes of Jesus. Scripture gives us a glimpse of so many things about Jesus, yet there are so many things that we can't even imagine or comprehend. There is mystery. However, the words that he spoke were so powerful that they often leave us speechless. In fact, it left the religious leaders of his time speechless. A lot of times they tried to back him in a corner by saying, well, what does the law say? Or what does this say? And Jesus, all-powerful, all-knowing, would actually speak to them with such power and authority that it left them speechless. If he had a microphone, he would have dropped the mic as he walked away. They didn't know how to comprehend his knowledge and wisdom. And again, the power and authority of his words. His words, in any situation, expressed forgiveness and power and truth. And today we're going to look at a third saying from the cross and the character of caring. Say this with me. He cares. Say that with me again. He cares. He cares about the little things in your life and he cares about the big things. He cares when you are on the mountaintop and he cares when you're down in the valley. He is a savior of caring. If he didn't care, he would have never died on the cross for you and I. He cares. His love for us shows that time and time again. When he picks us up, when we are struggling, and he carries us and pulls us up, he cares. In the, if you look up the word care in the thesaurus, it often describes words like passionate, sensitive, gentleness, considerate, and kindness. Wait, isn't gentleness and kindness one of the fruits of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22 says so. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want to read this story that I recently read on uh, History.com. It's about Elmer Curley Richardson, was born in 1918 in a small farm in Iowa. He started driving a truck at the age of 15. Elmer was not immediately drafted into World War II because uh, when the Americans joined in the war in 1941, the War Department considered many of the civilian truck drivers as essential stateside jobs because they needed to move supplies from one area to another and across country. His job was important. But in 1944, the U.S. Army was marching across Europe, and they needed every man they could get. Elmer was drafted into the Army in February. He was inducted into Camp Dodge and shipped to Tyler, Texas for training. After training, he made his way to New York City and then across the Atlantic and ended up in England. From there, Elmer was attached to the 12th Infantry of the 4th Division. Elmer was 25 years old, just a little bit older than many of the men in his unit. He rose to the rank of sergeant and his troops ended up in Hurtdig Forest on the border of Belgium and Germany. In late November, when he arrived, 
But by December, just a few weeks later, December 16th, the Germans launched their most aggressive and offensive uh, attack against the Allied forces. What would become known as the Battle of the Bulge, lasting more than a month. On December 18th, just two days after this aggressive attack, Elmer was riding in a jeep with another sergeant when they were ambushed by the German soldiers. The Germans opened fire on the jeep, which crashed into a ditch, and Elmer was shot in the gut. He briefly evaded capture, but eventually he was apprehended just two days later by the Germans and taken to a hospital hospital, a uh, German hospital, where he was in grave condition. There, Elmer ended up on the operating table of a German doctor named Ludwig Gruber. Ludwig finished his medical training in 1938 and was drafted in 1940 to serve with the German army. Again, there was a lot of bloodshed going on and they needed doctors. But mainly, it was the doctors that were supposed to be helping the German soldiers that were injured. Hundreds and hundreds of soldiers must have went through Dr. Gruber's uh, operating table during the war. Elmer was in bad shape. In fact, when he was shot, it had pierced his liver and his, his bowels, and he was in extreme grave danger. The bullet had managed to rip through uh, a lot of his internal organs. Elmer should have died. He was on he was an enemy and he was not entitled to the same care as the German soldiers were. However, Ludwig ignored what the hospitals commanded him to do and he spent hours in surgery on Elmer. He uh, resected his bowels and used rare techniques that saved Elmer's life. Lugwood's superiors barked at him, why are you spending so much time on this enemy? The doctor ignored their barks. Lugwood befriended Elmer. He wrote his address on a scrap piece of paper and told Elmer to write him if he survived the war. Lugwood fought to keep Elmer in the hospital under his care for as long as possible so his wounds could heal. By that time, the U.S. Army captain toured the hospital under a flag of truce. The Americans had planned on bombing that area because German military vehicles were parked right outside the hospital. The captain met with Elmer, he negotiated with the Germans, and the Germans would, or the Americans would not bomb the area of the Germans if they agreed to move the trucks. The trucks and military vehicles were moved and many lives were saved because Dr. Gruber had Elmer stay an extra week to heal. Elmer survived the war. He got back uh, from the military hospital and went to Iowa. Surgeons photographed the work that Ludwig had done on Elmer, and they were astonished. This was surgical skills was revolutionary for this time. A few years later after the war, Elmer actually wrote the doctor and thanked him for his kindness. Ludwig wrote back and expressed his joy for Elmer's survival. Ludwig actually died in 1988. And Elmer returned to driving a truck. He retired from his job and then drove a school bus for years until he died in 1996. All humbled by Ludwig's humanity in the middle of a war. No one could truly fathom why he chose Elmer out of all the hunters that were wounded, but he valiantly saved him. One thing is for certain. Life is cheap in war. In the middle of this hellish time of destruction and death came compassion and skill of an enemy surgeon who saved a young American soldier named Elmer Curley Richardson. Curley owed his life to the acts of kindness, compassion, and the human element of caring by this 
enemy doctor. We can find countless stories throughout the Bible where there are individuals and attributes or characters that stand out in the act of caring. Boaz, he instructed his workers in his field to leave grain for Ruth to pick up. This provided Ruth and her widowed mother-in-law with food they needed to survive. This act of kindness and compassion was not always seen among the owners of the fields, as Prophet was usually king of the pocket. They were worried about harvesting, getting the money, and selling it at the market, not leaving some for other people that were in desperate need of. Joseph, after being mistreated and sold into slavery by his brothers, then a long journey in the favor of God in his rising power of Egypt, Joseph showed compassion to his brothers when they came to Egypt looking for food during the famine. Compassion trumped revenge. Dorcas, in the book of Acts, a woman is introduced as one known for her care of widows and her provisions of clothing to the poor. She was much loved in the city of Joppa. When she became ill and died, the townspeople called for Peter. He took her by the hand and raised her back to life. What an example for us today. She made an impact in the area she was living. She made an impact in those that were in need. She made an impact so much that when she died, there was a huge void and the people cried out for help. And then we have to mention the Good Samaritan. Many of us know this story where Jesus told the story of a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And while on his way, he was robbed and beaten and left for dead. While others walked by ignoring him, not wanting to get involved or delaying their journey, the Good Samaritan came by, saw a person in dire need of help. He gives the man medical attention and takes him to an inn and pays for him to recover and rest there. What a phenomenal act of compassion to a total stranger. Although it is not directly mentioned, many scholars have agreed that Joseph, Jesus' earthly dad, had passed away before the ministry of Jesus even began. The culture of the day was that the families many times lived in communal houses. In other words, the adult kids stayed at the home and took care of some of the family affairs until marriage or one moved to another city. It could have been for financial reasons where income and resources were pooled together uh, to help support the family. We have to believe that Jesus must have been uh, supportive of this idea as he was a carpenter by trade that he learned from his father. I mean, who wouldn't want to buy from the master carpenter? If you were looking for a table, he was the carpenter to go see. No crooked or wobbly tables here. He, and he took care of his mother. He took care of his family. It was a source of income. Again, he cared. He had a, a lot of things. He was about to start his ministry, the hope of the world, yet he cared for his earthly family. The world wants to paint pictures that it's you against the world and that you have to look out for uno number one, yourself and always look out for yourself and that no one else uh no one else. You should not be looking out for anyone else but yourself. And that it is a dog-eat-dog -dog mentality. That phrase is used in reference to a situation of fierce competition in which people are willing to harm each other in order to succeed. If you take a piece of meat and you throw it between two hungry dogs, they are viciously attacking each other to get the meat. And that's what people do. They will harm each other in order to succeed. We see this not only during uh, the professional market, job market, but we also see it 
among family, among the siblings. And yes, it's even sad to say that, and I'm going to be real for a minute, we even see some of this dog-eat-dog -dog in the church for position or for accolades. It is, the devil has sold us a lie. I'm going to say that again. The devil has sold us a lie that the church is in a fierce competition with the church down the street. That the only way to have success and to add to your church or grow bigger or faster than the other church is to compete for the sheep. And that is a total lie from the devil. I'm going to say that again. The devil has deceived the church in believing that we are in competition with the churches down the street. That is not so. And that should not be the case. Can I just tell you that there are enough people in the world that far outnumber the capacity of all the Christian churches in the world? Even if every church had multiple weekend services, let's stop fighting over sheep and give the devil a black eye that the churches can come together under a biblical truth and swim in the same direction. I'm going to say that again, that the churches, the church, the church that proclaims Jesus, that we can come together, care for one another, and swim in the same direction under biblical truth. In heaven, there will be no denominational boundaries or competition. As Christians, we need to be demonstrating this to the world, the fruits of the Spirit and the attributes of Jesus. The world is always looking what is this whole Christian thing about? What is this whole Jesus thing about? What is so special about it? What is so gravitating that people go to church? The world is watching. And if we are in competition and we don't care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, what kind of message is that giving to the world? Now, what is so attractive to the church when we are acting like the world? We can't act like the world. We need to be above that. We need to make sure that we are speaking the truth and we are loving our brothers and sisters and that we are showing care. So let's look at our crosswords and see how everything that we talked about leading up to this point and after this points to the attributes of Jesus. John 19 verse 25 through 27 Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, referring to John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. First of all, I know that we could be looking at a lot of things in the text, but here are four women, and three of them are named Mary. Coincidence? Not really. Back in those times, Mary was a very popular name. But as they all stood at the cross, here is Jesus in a state of human physical death. Remember, he is nailed to the cross. Crucifixion, one of the cruelest ways to die. Yet he is concerned about his mother's well-being. At first glance, we see where he acknowledges his sweet-spirited mother, the one that's been by his side for everything. You know, the, in the scripture, it talks about the disciples, and the disciples followed him. Well, they had a group of women that were taking care of things, too, that were there witnessing things, that were listening to him speak, and one of them was his mother. She was the one that held that secret to the hope of the world in her heart for so long. She was the one that gave birth to him. She was the one that raised him, knowing that he was the Messiah, that he was the Savior. But what she did not know was that it was going to come down to the cross. The cross was confirmation of the prophecy. In Isaiah 53, verse 1 through 12, I just want to encourage you, after this message, go back. Chew on this passage, the words that point to the cross thousands of years ago before the tree had ever sprouted, or had it already sprouted. Read this passage and you decide for yourself. And he isn't identifying himself when he's saying, 
Dear woman, here is your son. At first glance, you might think that. He is nailed to the cross. He's looking down at her, and he makes this statement. He is referring to John. He says he wants his mother to look at John as her new caretaker. And the disciple John, he is saying, I'm transferring my mother's care to you. She is your mother now. Provide and protect her. Be there for her. Here is your mother. So we see examples of our word theme or our word and our theme today. Care, care, care from the cross. And you might be thinking, well, I'm not on a cross. I'm not Jesus. I'm Bob the butcher or Sarah the secretary. Um, I've got other responsibilities to look after. I've got little, three little humans running around with a dog. I've got to take care of them. I've got a husband that I've got to take care of. I've got a household I've got to take care of. I'm trying to juggle a job. I've got to care for them. I don't have time to care for other people outside of my family. I don't need distractions. I don't need anything else to worry about. Or maybe you're thinking, well... I get When I get some time or get some extra money and life slows down a little bit, then I'll become the Good Samaritan. Or maybe you're like, well, that's someone else's responsibility. Let someone else that has more time and more money do that. Let them care. Let the church or another organization take care of them. I don't think, uh, and if we think that the government is the answer, well, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Oh, but pastor... I want to, but I can't. We have to have the mindset that it is easy, what is easier to do, to pawn it off on somebody else and say, well, it's somebody else's problem, or to step up and say, hey, you know what? I can do something. I can do something. I mean, everyone is busy. We all only have 24 hours in a day. I mean, Boaz had fields to harvest, workers to manage. He didn't have time to direct his attention to a woman in a field, or did he? She later became his wife, and that's another sermon for another time. However, we see that Joseph was deeply scarred by his brother's actions years ago. And the dream of his brothers bowing down to him had just come true. They were at his mercy the world tells us that revenge is sweet. Looking at them beg for food, he could have been in delight and he could have said, you know what? <laughs> oh, now is my time. You're bowing down to me and you're in my hands. But his character didn't allow it. Compassion outweighed the competition. Remember, they didn't like him when he was younger. They didn't like him. That's why they wanted to kill him. And then they eventually sold him off to slavery. He had other duties to tend to. I mean, after all, he was second in charge of Egypt. And at that time, they were the only grocery store that was open. They were in his hands, and he didn't seek revenge. He cared for them. Oh, and Dorcas, the Bible doesn't give us insight to her entire life. She was, was she wealthy? Or did she have a GoFundMe page that raised millions for the needy? Her status is never suggested, but it didn't matter. She cared. She cared for the widows and she cared for the poor. She shared her soup and she gave clothes to the poor. She had compassion. Again, that's another word. Compassion and caring go hand in hand. Clothing. Cotton, silk, and polyester blends hold weight to someone. We all know that celebrities and, and the rich uh, have to be seen in the latest designs by the sought-after uh, sought designers from around the world. But clothes are a big deal to the poor as well. They are not only keeping them warm, but it is a sign of dignity also. We all feel good when we put on a new shirt or a new outfit. Our uniform at work makes us stand a little bit taller. We walk a little bit smarter. Well, at least we act that way anyways, right? We feel good about ourselves when we're wearing clothes. Nakedness and confidence have been an issue since the fall of the gar in the garden. Adam and Eve tried to cover up themselves with salad dressing. I mean, a fig leaf. Uh, 
because of their shame of exposure. And God's like, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. I'm the designer of everything. I am the first designer of all things. Let me sacrifice this animal and get some real clothes on you so they don't blow away in the breeze. And here is Dorcas, and she is clothing those in need. Again, dignity. That's why during crucifixion, the stripping of one's clothes was a stripping of one's dignity. It also was to bring about humiliation and shame. And the Good Samaritan was on a journey into the next town. Probably had was taking goods to the market. Time is money, yet he stopped to help someone that was in need. Did he have other responsibilities and duties to do? Of course he did. Listen, like I said before, we can't fix everything in the world, but we can do something. Well, I don't know what my contribution will even do. Those little things that you do are big things to those people that are in need. When you do the little things, Jesus will multiply that and do big things through you. Remember, it's not about getting the accolades for yourself. It's about pointing people to Jesus, that your, your Father in heaven is glorified. An act of kindness actually is a two, not twofolded, but actually is threefold. The recipient is blessed, you are blessed, and the Father in heaven is glorified. Can I get an amen to that? I'm going to say that again. The, the recipient is blessed, you are blessed, and the Father in heaven is glorified. Amen. But what about... When we are struggling ourselves and we are barely making it through the day or those times where hell has invaded our life and we feel like we're the ones hanging from the cross that no one cares about ourselves. How can I care about someone else if I am struggling myself? How can I show empathy to someone else when I am in desperate need? If your pocket and your hand is empty, smiles are free. I'm going to say that one again. If your pocket and your hand is empty, smiles are free. We have to show kindness in every possible way we can. Now, that's when we have to realize that we don't have to do it in our strength. We have to do it in the strength that Christ gives us. When we take our focus off of us and our problems, they seem to diminish just a little. When we focus our attention on some other people's needs, then our perspective is a little bit clearer. The mountain is actually just a hill. The storm is letting up and we see sunshine. The valley has a stream of refreshing water that takes us to the prairie to help other people. It takes us out of the valley. Caring is actually sharing in what Jesus wants to do. Caring is actually sharing and whatever he wants to use us to impact the world, he will use us in different ways. He will put people in front of us in different ways. We have that ability to show the world that we care, that Jesus cares. We don't have to be hanging from a cross. We carry our cross daily. And the world can be cruel when it comes to carrying our cross. From the cross we've seen in the previous weeks where Jesus, uh, where Jesus lives out what he spoke in Matthew 5, 44. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Not easy, but necessary. That is a hard thing to do when the world says, I don't care. And we are trying to show the world that we care, that Jesus cares. And we do what we can do, no matter how big or small it is. Jesus, we have to learn his attributes. Jesus didn't have to learn any, but we do. It, it was infused in him. That was his character. That was his design. The attributes of caring and loving and kindness. Those fruits of the Spirit. Those are ingrained in him. We have to learn and we have to exercise those. 
We, on the other hand, have a daily struggle against the spiritual battle that rages against us. I'm going to say that again. We got a spiritual battle that rages against us. You can't do everything, but you can do something. I can do something. The church can do something. We can do those little things that, again, show the world that we care. I have a question for you, all those that are listening. This question is for you as me as well. No one is exempt. Jesus was an example for all, and he died on the cross for all. But here's this question. What is the little thing? What is the little thing that you can do to glorify your Father in heaven? I'm going to say that again. What is it? What is that little thing that you can do that can glorify your Father in heaven? That points people to Jesus to show others we care. And if you ask God, you know what? I don't know what that little thing is. I don't know what that big thing is that I can do to show people that I care. What is it, Lord? Ask God to reveal it to you. Ask God to open up your heart and your mind to show you what you can do, your part in all of this big story, the big picture of how we can care for our brothers and sisters, how we can care for humanity, how we can care for those that are in need. Again, it's not to get a pat on the back. It's not to get accolades or get the participation trophy. It is to point people to Jesus, the hope of the world, the Savior of the world, the Messiah that died on the cross and cared even when he was at the point of death. Let us pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you today. We thank you that Jesus was a prime example of caring and loving from the cross. That he still is. And Lord, that we can do something to show the world that we care. It doesn't have to be huge. It can be little things. But those little things are big things to those people in need. Those little things are big things to the Father in heaven. Lord, we thank you that you're going to use us. Use us to change the world and show that we care and that we have the attributes and the fruits of the Spirit of Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. I just want to say thank you for joining us today. It was such a pleasure as we continue this series. Join us next week for week four of our series, Crosswords. Well, we never want to close out service without giving you the opportunity to ask Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. All you have to do is say this very simple prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I admit that I need a Savior. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the only Son of God that died on the cross for my sins and my salvation. That on the third day you rose from the grave and defeated death. And that you are alive today. Lord, I ask you into my life, and I will live all the days of my life for you. And in Christ's name I pray, amen and amen. If you said that very simple prayer today, I just want to say congratulations. Welcome to the family. Heaven is celebrating, and we want to take this journey with you. Contact us at the email below and let us know that you made that decision. We have some great resources we want to put in your hands as you take this journey. Again, congratulations, and let's celebrate together. Here at Freedom Church, the Black Hills, we exist to love God, love people, and love community. Your generosity is allowing us to continue spreading the good news of Jesus across the Black Hills and beyond. We have three simple ways that you can partner with us. You can go to our website and use our secure giving tab. You can mail your gift to the address seen below. Or if you're in a host home today, you can use our secure giving box. Again, thank you for your generosity.